All right. Yes, we have also Costantino that kindly brought water for everyone. So we have it. Uh, all right. Good morning to everyone. Let's start. We can start. Excellent. So uh, let me welcome you to this session on uh, fair share and zero rating. Who pays for the internet? Fair or unfair share, thank you for... <laughs> and also, let me also take advantage of this clarification to also uh, thank everyone, really, wholeheartedly, to be here at this very unfair time slot, 8.30, the last day. <laughs> so, it's, it's so you are very brave, and you really deserve a lot of appreciation for being here. And let me also welcome all our excellent panelists. First of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Luca Bellion, professor at FGV Law School, Rio de Janeiro, where I di direct the Center for Technology and Society. And exactly 10 years ago, actually, uh, together with some of the friends here, we created this coalition on net neutrality that then evolved into more internet openness dialogue. Uh, we also have a website, internetopenness.info, where all the works of the past 10 years are collected. So if you are interested in knowing more, you can check it, or the IGF website, of course. So let me welcome our distinguished panelist. We will start with Artur Coimbra, who is member of the uh, board of Anatel, the Brazilian Telecoms Regulator. Then we will have Camila Leite, who is a uh, member of the Brazilian Consumers Association uh, IDEC. Then we will have Jean-Jacques Sahel, who is Asia Paci Pacific Information Policy Lead and Global Telecoms Policy Lead at Google. Uh, then we will have K.S. Park, who is professor at the University of Korea. Then we will have Marit uh, Palo, Palo, Palo Virta, sorry for mispronouncing always uh, your name, who is Senior Director of Regulatory Affairs at Ethno. Then we will have Thomas Loninger, who is Executive Director at Epicenter Works. And last, but of course not least, Konstantinos Komaitis, that is Non-Western Fellow at the Atlantic Council. Uh, so, do just to provide you a little bit of context uh, of why we are here and what is the aim of today's session, we want to discuss the emerging tensions or on the uh, fair share or unfair share, as KS was reminding us, uh, debate, and also which kind of connection exists with the previous debates that we have been uh, discussing over the past years, especially zero rating debates, net neutrality debate. Uh, over the past year and a half, especially, we have uh, been uh, witnessing the emergence of this debate on regulatory asymmetries, and uh, there are some good arguments on one hand on of increased taxation of large uh, platform, but there are also good arguments on the other hand that uh, the proposed solution may not be uh, so effective. Uh, so the reason why we have today such diverse panel is precisely to try to understand what are the diverse, the, the, the different standpoints in this debate and try ideally to come to some common ground and and uh, maybe even policy suggestion for the future. Uh, now, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to our first speaker, Artur Coimbra, from the, the Anatel, the, the Brazilian Telecoms Regulator. Artur, you have been working a lot on telecoms over the past I don't want to reveal your age, so I, I just say <laughs> that you have a certain experience in this, so please, Artur, the floor is yours. Thank you, Luca. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm here representing Anatel, the Brazilian regulator. And let me just start by saying, to disappoint you, uh, and say that uh, as the so-called fair share or unfair share, I mean, network fee is an intended solution, a solution to a supposed problem that we're still assessing, I'm not here ready to say whether it's fair or unfair, but I just want to provoke the debate with some elements. Anatel, for example, has just uh, disclosed this night the results, the, the mapping results of arguments of its call for subsidies that it made three, three months ago. And we had 627 individual contributions on this topic uh, that were mapped and disclosed a few hours ago. And now we're going to dive into the arguments and, and provide an outcome of all the contributions that we received. Uh, let me just start by saying that uh, internet architecture has changed a lot in the last 15 or 20 years. 
So uh, in the golden age of internet, we had the users, we had the content, which was present in big data centers, expensive infrastructure, uh, located in a few places in the world, and between them, connecting users to the content, they were just uh, the network itself through IP transit contracts, bringing content to the user. So uh, the point is that uh, in the last 15 years, uh, data storage costs reduced by 98 or 99 percent, right? So it was a great revolution on micro data centers, content delivery networks, ca caching, and other kinds of infrastructure that brought the content near the user and changed the landscape of internet architecture. So today, uh, you not necessarily need a, f a full a full set uh, IP transit contract to, to bring the, the, the content to the user. And instead, uh, many, many providers uh, are getting the content just across the street in a micro data center and bringing it to do. It's better for everyone because it's cheaper. Uh, the service is better. You save money on IP transit contracts. So uh, theoretic the theoretically, everybody, every everybody wins. Uh, but alongside that, that phenomenon, uh, we've seen that the, the growth of some gatekeepers that are, that are gaining more and more economic relevance and adding value to the network, in fact, and people want to access internet to get to that specific content. That's bring, that brings a lot of uh, negotiating power over uh, the big, plat big digital platforms. Uh, so... Uh when there's a CDN uh, and the content is near the user and the operator has to deploy its own network to get that, to get that content without receiving nothing for the traffic, uh, instead of using an IP transit contract uh, by which the operator used to receive the payment from the, the content provider and in the end by the user, uh, well, there was a two-sided market has that has become a one-sided market, right? So that's, that's what... It is uh, the plea that, that telcos say. And there's another issue. The, the other issue is that uh, in many cases, uh, telcos plea that they cannot charge the user uh, more for the, for the consumption of, of a huge amount of data due to legal restrictions on data cap or uh, to other market factors. So uh, in the end, the argument is that you had a two-sided market by which you charge the content provider with the IP transit contract, and then you also charge the user, of course, he, he's the user, to a, and this two-sided market is becoming a no-sided market. So uh, this pressure, which could be a, a competition pressure, it could be, it's an certainly a negotiation pro uh, uh, pressure. So this pressure is, is raises the question uh, which is necessary to be answered before we decide if the fair share is fair or not. And the question is, is this pressure that big, tel big tech, big platforms are, are putting on telcos, is this pressure uh, the result of a bargain power or of a market power? So this is the main issue. If it's bargain power, it's part of the game. Okay, just go ahead. If it's market power, then there's a structural issue that must be tackled by regulators and by uh, legislators and so, and so on. So this is the main question that should be answered uh, before uh, we decide what to do with this. Uh, Anatel is working on it. And but but the f the my final line here, and the I think that the great takeaway of, of this discussion is that they're both on the same side of the boat, okay? Telcos and big digital platforms, they both depend on healthy, sustainable networks. Otherwise, it's bad for everyone. So that, that is a, an incentive for them to try and find a market solution, which, which will be great for everyone. And I really trust on that happening. And we hope that, we hope for just hope for the best. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much, Arthur, for these initial points. Very uh, well explained and now let's uh, stay in Brazil but with a, from a consumer perspective to understand a little bit more uh, the complete picture of this evolving discussion. Please Camila, the floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, Luca, for the opportunity and also for you that are here in this time of the morning. Uh, in Brazil, we have this context of this public consultation made by ANATO, but we have also a bigger context in Brazil in discussions about net neutrality, zero rating, and it involves not only the telecom authority in Brazil, but other several authorities. For example, zero rating practices were already analyzed in the by the competition authority in the past, and now the Ministry of Justice has been uh, pressured also to uh, to analyze uh, these uh, these practices in terms of consumer law. And this pressure was made by civil society. So to present myself, I, I am a specialist in digital rights and telecommunications in the Brazilian Institute of Consumers Protection. And we are, par we are part of a network on uh, digital rights, including access to the internet. And we are trying to, to raise these issues from more of a consumer perspective. And I think that this is the biggest challenge on that. Because when, when we are talking about fair share or unfair share, we are talking about big companies. We are talking about big techs versus big telcos, the new companies like the traditional companies. And the ones that suffer the most are consumers in the end. So to answer directly the question, yes, for uh, most part of the Brazilian society, definitely for EDEC and from the coalition in networks in Brazil, it is an uh, unfair uh, share if we have to, uh, to fee companies to, um, to this kind of services. We are very concerned of internet fragmentation and we are very aware that the, uh, the motive, the reason that the internet is successful is that internet was created to be an open environment and an interconnected uh, uh, environment. And once we do uh, practices like this, we separate, we created more of a um, second and first class users for uh, first and second class services in the internet. Since uh, the commissioner have already talked a little about the, the consultation in Brazil, I would like them to focus on how the unfair share connects to, to zero rating. And uh, for this, in the last few years, we've been working so hard to present not only this, uh, uh, these critics and these arguments against this kind of practices, but also to bring data on that. In Brazil, we have uh, a, strong, um, a strong organization that makes uh, internet connectivity research every year, which is CETIC, which is related to the Internet Brazilian Steering Committee. But we also have been, develop, uh, been developing a research uh, in EDEC to bring this data. And nowadays we are also developing uh, uh, research with Anatel. But to, to focus on this research that EDEC conducted uh, in 2021, or 2020-21, pandemic time, sorry, if I'm not mistaken, one of these two years. But uh, we've been interviewing uh, the Brazilian poorer classes to understand how do they use internet and how these kinds of limitations, for example, the zero rating ones, affect their lives. So we found out that people uh, with lower, um, in lower classes may, use, uh, may have mobile phone internet just for 21 days a month. So 21 days of 30 days. What, the, what this means? This means that in the last days of the month, people are uh, depending on Wi-Fi, public Wi-Fi or home Wi-Fi, which not everyone have, and people rely more on mobile phone access. And this kind of access is limited. It's not based on speed, it's based on data franchise. And once the internet is over, you have some kind of access. But which kind of access do you have? you have access just to some limited uh, apps, some limited companies, which in Brazil are the big techs in the end, especially, especially Meta. These bring some issues that, I know that I'm expanding a little the scope of this, Luca, but it's important to say that when, when we are talking about telecom, when we are talking about access, we are talking also about other rights. So uh, this information is also a huge issue that, uh, that that is a consequence on all of that. Because once people do not have access to confirm the information, they receive some information, for example, in WhatsApp or Facebook, and they share it without confirming it. So we have to talk about these issues, not only talking about net neutrality, not only talking about internet access, which should be in the center, but to talk how this affects other several other rights. So.
Thank you so much, Luca. Thank you very much, Camille. Also, to start stressing this connection between the fair share and uh, zero rating, and actually to add a little bit of element of complexity. I think that uh, maybe for people in the global north, if we can say so, where fair sh zero rating is not that common, this not does not sound evident. But in global south country, observers are a little bit puzzled when they uh, hear this debate about uh, platforms contributing more to network fees because platforms have been subsidized basically with zero rating for the past 10 years. And I think we have been speaking about this issue several times over the past years, the fact that zero rating actually would have created this kind of situation where large platforms are uh, responsible for most of the traffic precisely because they have been uh, subsidized, sponsored for free with zero rating in most global South countries. So it's it's interesting to see that nowadays, after having offered this traffic, uh, and uh, as Camilla was saying, in some part, some weeks, the last week of is a new kind of poverty in many countries. At the end, you, you 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 end your you finish your data allowance, like you finish your money, and then as you don't have more money to go to the supermarket, you only have data allowance to have uh, social media, basically. and so, th But that is not something that has happened because the internet is like that. It's a result of a specific business model. And we, uh, many of us have, uh, have, have questioned that business model, but uh, now it's surprising to see that, uh, the on the other hand, we see operators that may claim fair share when this, uh, if you want to say, large con use of the network is the re precise result of this business model that has been uh, enacted over the past 10 years precisely by operators. To, to understand a little bit more of the complexity, let me give the floor to Jean-Jacques that has been also dealing with these issues for, uh, I don't want to reveal again your age, but for a lot of time. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you, Luca, G uh, good morning. Um, I mean, I've been dealing with the open internet since I first tried the internet in 1993 because it's it's always been open, uh, although it was very, very slow, I have to admit, in 1993. Uh, certainly from where I connected at the time in Marseille, uh, it was like a 56K modem connection linking three universities. That was the only one connection. Um, now we have 12 subsea cables arriving in Marseille. We have fantastic connectivity. Um, although I'm, I've been actually hearing people complain that we have too much, too many cables arriving at the city. So, you know, we need to know what, what, what we want anyway. Um, but that's kind of part of the discussion in a way. I, I, I think, generally speaking, it's great to be at the IGF and in forums like this, where among stakeholders across different parts of the ecosystem, we can look at the concerns that there are. And we can try to look at the evidence, uh, share ideas uh, for, for, for what could be improved. Um, and I think what we all care about here is, you know, at the end of the day, how can we get a good internet tool, an internet that's affordable, uh, that's got good speed, good capacity, and why do we want that? Because, well, it's enjoyable for people, hopefully, but it also can support digital transformation. It can help our societies, it can help our economies, it can help us as people every day. That's really the end goal. Uh, so connectivity as a means to support uh, wider benefits to the economy and society, and that's the end goal. Um, and so when we get to uh, this debate of uh, network usage fees, as they are <coughs> referred to in some places, um, I actually think it's a false debate. And it was a false debate when it was first mentioned in something like 1999. You can see the quotes, they were pretty much the same as what's been said by some people, actually sometimes the same people then. Uh, it was a fake debate 10 years ago. Um, not to say we shouldn't have the debate, but I think we, we need to move on. I think the reality is that, and I think most of us in the room know this, we are an ecosystem in the internet, starting with users and encompassing essential elements in this virtuous cycle that we have, and these essential elements are the telecom operators, uh, network operators, and the content and application providers. Uh, there is a virtuous dynamic where there are there is innovation, there are content and services created that appeal to customers and their or to consumers, users, and then they subscribe to the internet. And I think that's been working well for 40 years. It's still working well today. That's what the open internet is about. It's innovation without permission that m that boosts this whole ecosystem. 
and, 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 and uh, supports the benefits that the internet has been bringing us. Um, and when we think about this from a business perspective, uh, when we as a company look at uh, ISPs, telecom operators, we see them as essential partners, both indirect partners in the sense that you know, we create content and applications for our users. They provide that connectivity that users want to access our content services. So there's a nice indirect element, indirect dynamic. And then we have direct relationships. We partner with telecom operators on a huge amount of things and it's been like that for many years we do it for commercial reasons you know they might resell our cloud or you know add bundles of uh, you know youtube premium for instance perhaps in the in their own subscription packages but we also do some infrastructure work with them so for instance increasingly we help them with uh, storing some of the network um, aspects elements in our cloud they use some of our data analytics to optimize their networks and make cost savings um, or indeed we, we look at much more innovative things. For instance, we have a, a joint 5G research center with one of the large operators in, in Europe. So we have all sorts of direct partnerships as well. It's a very dynamic and generally very friendly and fruitful environment. And I think that's the sort of thing that we'd like to focus on, this virtuous ecosystem. So going back very briefly on network fees, because um, you know, there's been some great uh, points made, I think, it's, it's been shown already, it would, the introduction of these fees would be very unhelpful to consumers, to competition, uh, and also to the technical workings of the internet, to the efficient routing of internet traffic. Many stakeholders have said that, including a number of governments, telecom and competition regulators and others. Uh, we need to focus instead on, 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 on real problems, uh, thinking about how we can get the open internet to really favor innovation and encourage users to use and to enjoy the internet and, and support digital transformations. I think we need to join forces together um, and look at the genuine issues. Think about things like how do we reach the last 5 or 10% of the population that, that live in difficult to reach areas? How can we use a mix of interesting new technologies perhaps to reach them as an example? How can we continue to facilitate making it easier to deploy infrastructure like to lay fiber or to lend submarine cables or to make more spectrum available, for instance, on an unlicensed basis so that we can facilitate things like Wi-Fi offload which take the strain off the networks? Um, how can we bring, bring basically resiliency and diversity to connectivity and support the use of the open internet for the good of society, the economy, and us as users, people? Thank you. Thanks, uh, thank, uh, thank you very much, Jean-Jacques. And actually, now I would like to give the floor to uh, KS Park because uh, South Korea is actually what the only example of a country where this kind of uh, fees have been introduced, and so it would be interesting to understand what is the result of the concrete result in the internet ecosystem of this, of the implementation of this model? Uh, so, sender payroll uh, obvious obviously works like uh, uh, tax uh, tax on internet, uh, to be exact, taxation on speaking online, because uh, to speak online you have to push out data onto the network. Uh, so the more you speak, the more you have to pay somebody. Uh, just like in the days of um, you know, snail mail and um, telephony, to send a letter out, you have to, put a, you have to buy a stamp. Uh, to make a phone call, you have to pay the telecom company. Uh, so uh, this has uh, made, um, this created, uh, now the rule was instituted only among ISPs. Um, and using that as an excuse, the policymakers did not consult with the consumers and content providers. Uh, so the center payroll applies only among ISPs. Um, but the impact, ec the economic impact of that uh, of course, trickles down to content providers because uh, ISPs hosting popular content providers will end up pushing out more data to other ISPs because uh, users on other ISPs will want to access the uh, uh, access that popular content, um, and you know, accessing the content means the data files made up of HTML 
will have to be pushed out to the users. Um, so uh, that creates disincentives across the board among ISPs to host popular content or any content. Um, and that has increased the, uh, you know, that basically um, removed the competition among ISPs in uh, selling their services to, uh, in, 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 in hosting a good content on their network. And that has increased the internet access fees. Um, well, I mean, it didn't really increase. What happened was, uh, you know that because of uh, the technical advancement that Arturo talked about, the internet access fees are falling by 20% every year. Uh, but Korea, uh, it didn't happen. So that continued for about, in, in the, the rule was instituted in like 2016, and now it's uh, um, uh, almost seven years now. Um, s over seven years, the, uh, well, actually, immediately, even 2017, the internet access fees, um, or in technical terms, is transit, I IP transit fees in South Korea uh, was clocked at, um, was was measured to be eight times that of Paris, five, six times Los Angeles in New York. Um, and the trend worsened in 2021, um, the internet access fees or, or, or IP transit fees uh, became uh, 10 times Frankfurt, uh, eight times London. Um, you can see the, uh, uh, the finance are very hostile financial environment that startups uh, have to, uh, domestic startups, I, I say domestic because the domestic ones have to buy uh, internet access from local telcos. Um, and like 2021, uh, Korea's answer to Netflix uh, called Wacha, um, a video streaming service, was paying 10% of its revenue as uh, internet access fees. Uh, in 2020, uh, public interest app like you know, COVID location announcement system, uh, it's, it's, it's also app. Uh, the, the operator complained that uh, because of uh, uh, high internet transit fees, uh, they cannot fully function. Uh, they cannot uh, meet all the demand. Um, so that's what's happening with the domestic content providers. And overseas content providers, uh, they also have a problem because um, because of this, uh, you know, this, this incentive, this, <coughs> the, uh, this incentives among ISPs uh, from hosting popular content applies both uh, overseas content when they are on the uh, cache servers. I mean, Arturo talked about how uh, the data storage uh, uh, has become cheap and then now the content is coming across the street. Uh, so a lot of content is uh, being served through cache servers on the network of uh, uh, Korea's uh, ISPs. But even hosting the cache server has become you know, unpopular among ISPs because uh, they have to bear uh, the sender pay uh, uh, burden. Uh, so they are charging, increasing the, you know, what is technically paid peering fees that they have charged the overseas content. Um, so Twitch, which is a popular uh, gaming platform, uh, they could not continue making the payment. So, you know, they could do two things. They could charge the uploaders from Korea for uploading, right? Because uh, it, it is because of their, or, or, or they could charge the contents that are popular among Korean eyeballs, right? It is those contents that are generating uh, more payment burden on Twitch. They couldn't do that because, uh, I mean, you know, making people pay is uh, very unfair. So what they did was they intentionally degraded the service. They lowered the resolution uh, to uh, to uh, 750. Uh, so only in Korea, um, you know, users are watching Twitch at a 
lower resolution uh, than other parts of the uh, country. So a lot of uh, users are leaving. Uh, a lot of uh, gamers are also leaving because you know Korean gamers uh, video will be watched more by Korean eyeballs, uh, and um, that is. Uh, um, and, and if Korean eyeballs are you know getting lower lower resolution, uh, Korean gamers will leave. Um, and this, um, I mean, we can we can extrapolate that to like Netflix. I mean. You know, Squid Game, these uh, are popular Korean titles. Uh, they are, yes, world popular, but they are, uh, yes, they are world popular, but they are also uh, initially popular with the Koreans too, right? It's, it's, it's a Korean eyeball heavy content. And if Netflix is required to pay Korean ISPs uh, for accessing Korean consumers, they'll have to reduce investment in uh, Korean heavy. Uh, Korean eyeball heavy uh, titles. So um, that is the situation in Korea. I hope you guys don't learn this lesson or learn the lesson either way. Um, and um, I, I hope I, I have a few minutes later to talk about some of the uh, general um, you know, uh, argumentation. Yeah, thank you very much, KS, for this insight. And actually, I think I propose we, we finish with the, all the, the presentations so that we then have a good moment for discussion because I'm sure there will be a lot of remarks, comments, and uh, occasions to discuss more of this. Uh, let's move now to Europe, that is now the center, has been the center of, at of the attention over the past uh, year, at least, also for a consultation from the European Commission. So, Marit, uh, Ethno has been one of the main proponents of this uh, fees, so please, Mari, the floor is yours. Thank you, Luca, and um, thank you to the organizers of the panel. It's very nice, actually, to hear global views. Uh, as you know, we've been discussing this in Europe a lot, mainly amongst ourselves, uh, but it's really, really, I think, uh, uh, fruitful to also have this um, global exchange. And just to go to the title of the workshop, so many of you know that zero rating is, is no longer uh, a reality in Europe, so I will focus my comments on the, um, on the fair contribution as such. And perhaps uh, for the sake of um, well, the audience today, who maybe you haven't followed all the discussions in Europe, I will start with a few, few thoughts on, on how do we see the telecoms market at the moment in Europe. Um, and I already heard some of the key words from, from the different um, interventions, namely to do with the kind of market structure and competition and, and the different dynamics that are related regarding consumers, of course, and, and society as a whole as well. So I'll try and give you a bit of a background here um, as a kind of a starting point. So indeed, um, we do have been now for nearly two years um, advocating and have tried to uh, bring some, well, kind of describe the context around this fair contribution issue from our perspective. And um, the market in Europe, as we see today, is, and, and many of you probably saw that the European Commission published the summary results of the public consultation just two days ago. So I'll use one of the quotes that they um, put into that, which came from the Ethno GSMA reply, and is with regards to the competition. So in Europe, when we look at the number of operators in the EU markets, the number of operators that are serving more than 500,000 customers, so more than half a million customers, in Europe is 38. In the US, that is seven. In Japan, that is four. So the market structure in the EU is significantly different uh, than it is in many other parts of the world that could be comparable to Europe. That means that as we are in an industry of heavy capex investment, so digging fibers into the ground, building towers for 5G, etc., that requires a lot of money, a lot of effort by, by many people. Um, and it means that simply this current market structure does not allow for proper investment uh, into these infrastructures that actually our society wants. Our consumers want that, our, our policy makers and politicians want that, and also we want that. But the current market structure simply doesn't allow for that. Uh, the return on investment uh, doesn't allow for the investment. Um, we have some regulatory uh, specific circumstances in Europe. So we have competition policy that restricts mergers. So telecom operators are not 
encouraged or allowed really to merge with each other for the moment, uh, just to simplify things. We have uh, still some heavy sector specific regulation for the telecom sector, for example, on pricing. So we have pricing regulation. You have all heard maybe about the roaming rules in, in Europe, uh, wholesale prices. They are all fixed prices. So flexibility to price services is limited. And just to give you an idea that also the competition in the market, due to the fact that, well, there is this kind of sticky prices uh, situation, but also the fact that there are so many players, is that despite the very heavy inflation that we also, I think, in our countries last year, the telecom se sector in Europe was the only industrial sector where the price growth was negative. Mm -hmm. So the prices went down despite the inflation. And this is because of the heavy competition pressure on the industry and, and the, the pricing uh, elements that I just described. So there are some real pain points in the European telecom market that may not necessarily exist in, in other parts of the world. Now, when we look at the consumer uh, impact, of course, the main point of operators is to provide good services for the consumer. And affordability certainly is, is, is a key issue. And I think I just provided some elements why, why Europe has the most affordable, some of the most affordable uh, internet services uh, in the world. But also other important factors are things like quality. So if we don't invest sufficiently, quality eventually will suffer. Trust. If we don't invest, you know, and update security and make sure that we are, you know, bringing the new layers into the networks, also this factor will suffer. And this will, at the end, we believe, will start, well, making our consumers unhappy as well. So it's not only a question about prices in Europe, it's about these other factors. So we are really looking at this uh, from this kind of more holistic uh, perspective. And maybe a third factor I would like to raise, because we talk a lot about societal welfare at the moment. So, you know, security is certainly one thing, but sustainability, environmental sustainability is also important. So we are now developing different kinds of uh, KPIs in Europe um, to try and make sure that all industry players, including operators and networks, are as sustainable as possible. And that, of course, means that uh, we do not only measure, but we also, again, invest in networks to make sure that in, in all ways possible, we try and make them uh, as sustainable as possible. So that's a little bit where we come from um, in, in, in Europe. And um, so, so, you know, our kind of we see that our hands are, at the moment, uh, a little bit tight. And I would like to maybe touch on the net neutrality point as well. You know very well that Europe is, is one of the uh, very few, uh, well, countries or regions in the world where we have net neutrality open internet regulation. And uh, you may also know that the European Commission uh, evaluated this regulation, I think it was earlier this year, and asked many stakeholders, including us, if we should reopen this regulation, if we should indeed uh, reconsider it perhaps. And as the Commission has also many times said publicly that no stakeholder came forward asking for reopening of the regulation. <laughs> and indeed so, Etno, uh, together with, again, the GSMA, so representing really 80-90% uh, of the European telecommunication market, said, we are happy with the open internet principles. The regulation, the text, okay, you may argue if it's, you know, the best as, as, as we kind of look at the developments in our industry today, but it is not worth opening it because we still believe that uh, the, the principles are valid. And this, of course, from our perspective, also then, I'm going to enter a little bit to the market asymmetry that we see related to the um, uh, fair contribution. It means that we as operators have a must carry obligation, just again to simplify things. So operators will carry any traffic, how big, how small, in whatever shape or form, coming from whoever to the end user today in Europe. Or if they don't, then they of course risk going to the court, which you know, some operators might want to do, but uh, in general, I don't think this is the case. And so there is a one-sided obligation uh, to deliver traffic. And again, this then gives us very limited uh, possibilities to manage and try and optimize the data traffic. And this is, um, as, as, and as we know, that this is something that has, again, gone up quite a lot. So we are in a situation we have where we have pressure on investment, but we also have then pressure 
on, on this kind of increasing digitization of our society, which of course we all welcome, but we need to make sure that you know, we have a balance between the networks that are supposed to deliver this and are a key part of our internet ecosystem, and then this kind of services and content part. So maybe I'll just stop there and happy to then chip in later. Thank you very much, Marit, for providing us a very good overview of the uh, telecom market in, in, in Europe. And uh, speaking about the consultation, I know that uh, also Thomas has been very active into participating in this and uh, might have also a different perspective on it. So please, Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Luca. And I also want to thank um, Marit in particular for being here. I know representing the telecom industry in this round it, uh, might not be easy and I, I think it's always a, a pleasure if we get to have this exchange and uh, these honest exchanges are necessary for moving the debate forward. Marit and I had a very similar debate actually last IGF in Ethiopia um, and I'm, I'm a little bit saddened that we always need to have these debates in other corners of the world and while there are network fee debates, um, maybe two or three every month happening in Brussels. It's very rarely that uh, voices from consumer protection or civil society are present there. So maybe that's a good reason for having the IGF, I think. Um, anyway, I would, I would also like to touch on the issue of zero rating and network fees because yes, we have no more zero rating in Europe, but still those two things are very much connected. Um, you have in both cases the ISPs functioning as a gatekeeper, um, exercising control about how the user experiences the internet. And if you also look at the political statements, um, zero rating was a very common practice happening in all but one EU member state. Um, and it is, as Luca described, incentivizing the user to use more unlimited traffic from big tech companies. And so it was funny when after zero rating was outlawed in 2021, telcos turned around and said, exactly this traffic we've been giving away for free is now becoming the problem, is now cluttering up the pipes. And I wanna also maybe focus in a little bit on why there's such a drastic shift that we are discussing here. Um, internet connection used to be something altruistic. It's something where uh, nerds put cables together in order to make the internet whole to allow global end-to-end -end connectivity. And that's usually done and optimized for resilience, for optimizing quality. And with this proposal, we would drastically step away from that. We would optimize for profit. We would maybe no longer have local caching service. We would uh, need, like we see in South Korea now, uh, make a far longer travel in order to get to the data that we want. And it would become more expensive, ultimately, either the prices that we as consumers have to pay or the quality we experience would have to suffer. Um, and I also want to briefly explain, because maybe that's not clear for everyone, why net neutrality is inherently incompatible with network fees. Um, everybody agrees that even in the oldest version of net neutrality, you cannot have paid fast links. You cannot have one railway for everyone and then a faster railway where you have to pay in order to be on it. And in effect, and, and Mart called this the must carrier, the, um, in effect, you only get good quality with Deutsche Telekom, a uh, big German provider right now, if you pay them. Uh, you will suffer uh, every night, every peak hour with your service if you don't have a paid connection into their network. And yes, technically speaking, uh, they are not slowing down the traffic within their network. They're just ensuring that the entrance to their network is a bottleneck that's always congested. And funny enough, their prices to have these interconnections are 10, 20, 30 times more expensive than everyone else's. Um, it is very important to make a pause here. We are now <laughs> one and a half years into this debate, into the uh, 2020 iteration of it. For the first time, we have a public record from the consultations in Brazil and in Europe on what everybody has said. I only had time to look at the European one, but I think it's interesting to just list the people who have contributed, the organizations and what they've said. We have the 
the conglomerate, the body of all telecom regulators that say this violates net neutrality and is dangerous for the internet ecosystem. We have the media regulators saying uh, this is bad for media pluralism. Again, pointing to South Korea and similar considerations went into their statement. And it's not just the regulators, it's the public broadcasters, it's the private broadcasters, it's journalistic associations. We have the whole technical community from the ITF downwards. Um, we have uh, the internet exchanges, the AMSIX, D6, and D6 is the world leader, a European world leader in this field. And they are also quite uh, upfront with their criticism. And of course the copyright industry, uh, Disney, is on the same side as Google and as consumer protection organizations. So this is a coalition of unlikely allies. Um, and uh, to conclude maybe, um, I think actually we don't have a problem with the market structure in Europe. Competition is the success recipe of Europe when it comes to telecoms. We don't need more concentration. Telcos are making profits, just not big enough profits, but if whole society is complaining and saying, stop, this will hurt us, maybe the profit margins from telecom companies shouldn't be the deciding factor if everybody else gets hurt by such a proposal. And uh, lastly, I also want to say that now, almost five months after the consultation has concluded, we have this data in hand since two days ago. Funny enough, on the same day when it was announced that uh, Commissioner Breton is giving up on this proposal for this legislative term. Uh, to remind you, uh, Commissioner Thierry Breton used to be CEO of France Telecom. And as a European, I have to say I'm shamed by the way uh, he has broken every rule and due process safeguard we have in Europe. And I'm not saying this just to civil society. Seven countries, including Germany and the Netherlands, issued letters to the Commission saying exactly the same. Please uphold due diligence standards. And at least when Europe influences a worldwide debate, like in India and Brazil, where every, everyone is referencing Europe, we should set ourselves to a higher standard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas, for this. And actually, I, I, I want to pick up on one, on on one of the points that you mentioned that the, uh, about the, the very large and diverse spectrum of uh, stakeholders that participated to this consultation, uh, raising uh, some s some concern with uh, the the effectiveness of this uh, proposal, and I think that honestly, if we had the same consultation with regard to the idea of taxing more uh, uh, large platforms, they would all agree that that that, that there, there, there it is with all due respect for Google, of course, <laughs> there is the, a, a need maybe to have a, a better regime, a more effective regime of taxation. But I think the fundamental question here is that uh, maybe the, 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 go the, the way forward is not really to tax the, the, the traffic that is injected in the network because consumer demand it, but maybe to tax the, 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 the data, the personal data that are harvested by big tech so that you know in a more effective way so that the, then the, the benefits can be redistributed socially right so I think that the, the, the we mm, virtually everyone would agree that a fair a, a fair share some kind of fair share is not a bad idea uh, but maybe this type of fair share fair share is not really the solution that uh, for, for for the problem right if you want to larger redistribution of wealth. Uh, I think that uh, some uh, in in additional uh, elements may be also shared by Konstantinos that has been working a lot on internet policies, infrastructures for the past uh, decades. Again, not revealing anyone's age here. So please, uh, Konstantinos, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Luca. Good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you for showing up. I, I really thought that this would be an empty uh, room. Um, so I think that... One of the biggest challenges, at least for me, and uh, in those past 20 years, is that we have been attempting to think of the internet, which is a new medium, by applying old rules. And telecoms rules have been one, one such rules that we have been trying to apply um, uh, ever since I remember starting uh, in this field. And this is really a, a bad idea because 
telecoms rules operate under termination monopolies, and in the internet, they simply, that simply does not make any sense. Uh, and it doesn't make really sense because it will create really barriers to, uh, to entry in the most unpredictable uh, of ways. Um, we are at the Internet Governance Forum, and all of us uh, are talking about how to support the open, global, and interoperable internet. And there is really no question that if we apply this policy, the open and global and interoperable internet is going to suffer. And it's going to suffer at the level of interconnections. Um, in the internet, the great thing about the internet is that really there is no network that is more important than another network. The more networks connect with one another, the bigger the value for the networks themselves and also for their customers. And uh, this also creates more resilience because the more networks you have, the more decentralized the system is and you are avoiding single points of failure. Um, so we currently have an interconnection system that works, that doesn't require regulatory intervention, and it of course has allowed to have low barriers uh, to entry. Uh, and of course, it has fostered all these very collaborative relationships, which I'm sure collaboration is very challenging in the best of times, but so I'm sure that collaboration is challenging in this instance, but let's not forget that the internet, the open internet, is an outcome of collaboration amongst many different and diverse actors. So that is my first point. The second point is about the infrastructure and the idea that currently, or at least that's the way the policy, uh, this policy idea has been framed, is that there is only one actor contributing to infrastructure, and these are telecom operators. And this is not necessarily true, right? Um, technology companies, uh, content and application providers, are contributing heavily in the internet ecosystem and its infrastructure, CDNs and data centers uh, and cloud services being mm -hmm. uh, clear mm -hmm. examples. And the OECD is actually working on a report which hopefully will be released next month. But the scoping paper made a really, really strong case about the diversity of infrastructure mm -hmm. and that it comes from the most unpredictable places that we can imagine. Municipalities contribute in internet and broadband infrastructure. Um, pension funds, um, hedge funds contribute in infrastructure. Of course, telecom operators, technology companies, tower companies. So we see a whole huge ecosystem where different players contribute to make sure that we have a reliable, secure, and sustainable infrastructure that can support the increasing demands of users because the fact of the matter is that there is an increasing demand. Right now, everybody wants to stream video, and that is what it is. But there is this um, collaboration, if you want, that is happening. People are coming all together in order to, uh, to make sure that networks can actually support this. And the last point that I want to make is about network neutrality. And I do appreciate that the Commission has been um, has tried mm -hmm. to ease the concerns that this is not a network neutrality issue. Uh, but I would bet, well, not a lot of money because I don't have them, but I would bet money uh, on it that if that case were to go before the ECJ, it would have been a very, very different outcome. In Europe, I think we've heard it from everyone, uh, we have the open internet regulation. And between 2020 and 2021, there have been four cases that, and two of them actually said that the, it's not just te uh, technology discrimination that violates network neutrality, meaning that you know when you're blocking and you're throt or you're throttling traffic, but it's also economic discrimination. And two in particular cases focused specifically on that, on the idea that if you choose certain applications and content providers to making those deals and not apply those deals to everyone else, this is also against the open internet regulation and network neutrality. So we have to be clear about this, that this is predominantly about internet neutrality. And uh, again, I appreciate the, um, the effort to try to make it less so, but that is not really the case. And I will stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Constantinos.
And actually, uh, one of those cases, the Telenor case, was precisely about also uh, uh, zero rating. And it's it's good to see to hear from Marit that uh, Europe now has abandoned this this policy that many of us have criticized over the past year. But it's also good to remind that until the pandemic times. In countries like Germany, there were like models like binge on that were literally, as the name suggests, was an invitation to binge on video. And so the fact that now the telecom operators uh, consider this increase in, in traffic as something problematic uh, may be curious for those who were used to see the very same telecom offering for free uh, video traffic and encouraging users to use it as much as they can carelessly, actually. Uh, through binge on models. I think we have had a lot of very interesting suggestions so far, and I'm very happy we still have half an hour for debate because I'm sure there will be a lot of debate. Uh, now, let me uh, start by opening the floor uh, because I know that uh, you are not only very brave to be here at half past eight in the last day, but I see a lot of uh, people that may be interested in sharing comments or asking questions. So if you want to ask question or mm, share your ideas, please you can line up and use this mic. Uh, otherwise, I, we can. I think we can. We might. Ha I'm sure we'll have reactions here from the panel. Uh, if you if you have any questions, just raise your hand or line up there. Otherwise, we can start with the reactions here. Yes. Okay. Yes. I I think one confusion um, on whether. Um, network usage be or, or a fair share, unfair share deal uh, violates net neutrality is uh, because of the presence of a uh, paid peering. Um, paid peering, although it doesn't account for a lot of traffic, I mean, uh, well, it doesn't account for a lot of connections. Most connections, ni more than 99.99% are uh, settlement free peering. Um, but I even through that small number of connections, a lot of traffic go through that. So uh, if you get the, if you look at the data from RCEP, the, the France, French regulator, uh, although the number of connections is uh, mostly uh, uh, settlement free, uh, in terms of uh, volume of traffic, uh, sizable uh, portion of internet traffic go through uh, paid peering points. Uh, but uh, that does not um, and, and then, you know, FCC has not clearly, uh, FCC in the U.S. Uh, or even um, Barrack uh, have not uh, clearly uh, said, you know, open internet regulation uh, applies uh, uh, against uh, paid peering. Um, so what uh, telcos, I mean, telcos are not really saying it, uh, but, um, you know, to be a telcos advocate, uh, to, to, to make their arguments more reasonable, um, they may be saying that, oh, you know, this is a paid peering that has uh, existed before, and, you know, um, Google has paid Orange paid peering fees, uh, and, and uh, Netflix uh, has paid uh, Comcast paid peering, paid peering fees before. So we just want to make it rule to make it more fair, and this does not, you know, violate net neutrality. But what they're forgetting is that this um, will number one, will not be enforceable. Well, actually, it's, th it's the same point. Uh, there's no number one, number two. It's the same point. This will not be enforceable because uh, it will be mandatory paid peering. But what has really supported the information revolution is two rules, freedom to connect and network neutrality. Okay, So freedom to connect and no freedom to charge for data delivery. Uh, these two rules are actually uh, the uh, two sides of the same coin. Um, it is because the the network participant. Uh, it is because ISPs are bound to uh, uh, this uh, uh, bound to this rule that they cannot charge for data delivery. Um, they can charge only for uh, connection capacity, not not for. Uh, the, the data delivery. It, it is because of this, uh, uh, what Mary called one-sided obligation, although I don't think it's obligation. Um, it, it is more like exchange of promises over uh, between ISPs to sell this, uh, this global product uh, to internet. Uh, it is not really uh, obligation imposed uh, externally. But uh, anyway, it, it is because of this uh, one-sided obligation uh, that 
you know, all ISPs have a freedom to connect or not connect. Uh, and if, uh, is, if a mandatory paid peering is imposed, what's going to happen is, you know, if Google, Netflix, they can say, oh, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to pay fees to access customers in your uh, network, and you know, they're not going to just connect. And you know, uh, the eyeballs in that country will no longer uh, access Google. Um, if uh, all these content providers burdened with uh, uh, peering fees, you know, don't connect. What are the regulators going to do? I mean, there's really not much can do if we want to keep the internet as it is. So I think it's unenforceable, and I think it is uh, it, it is really pulling the rug under the uh, uh, the fundamentals of uh, internet architecture, which is uh, uh, freedom to connect or not connect, and removal of uh, uh, data delivery uh, fees. Just one more, when I have a mic. Uh, Mary, Mary, Mary talked about how uh, you know prices are falling. Well, I, I want to ask whether your costs have been falling also. Because, uh, um, because of the advancement te uh, technology, you know, putting together KPEX and OPEX, uh, even with uh, uh, catapulting of uh, data traffic like five times, the network maintenance cost and development, de development cost have remained the same in, in, in the past five years. So I thank you very much for the very extensive points, KS. And now, uh, Marit, please, the floor is yours to reply. Yes. Maybe just on, on immediately on that question, the cost, no, they're not falling. And if you read carefully the summary of the con uh, consultation, actually, there was some uh, general language around that as well. They are not, of course, able to quote numbers because these are commercially sensitive, but uh, uh, the costs are not falling, no. I wanted to comment on the um, IP interconnection market because there is this <sighs> in Europe and much globally as well, still this very old-fashioned uh, way to think that IP interconnection means peering and transit. And that's the market and that's the base for competition. Now, in the last years, we've seen reports, including by Berek, including by Analysis Mason, that in fact CDNs should now be considered a substitute to transit and peering. So in fact, the market definition has effectively changed and we should be looking at a market that also includes the CDNs. Now if you look at the CDNs that for example you know many tech players have have in Europe these are of course often proprietary uh, infrastructures and they're also infrastructures where these owners and, and the operators of these CDNs they sell capacity at a price to whoever needs capacity, so whoever needs uh, their content to be delivered. And these prices, because they're proprietary networks, are not publicly known. They are not considered in a market analysis when we look at the pairing markets. And we actually are very happy to see that Berek now, in their program for next year, have quite an ambitious kind of a task. So they will be reassessing the IP interconnection market and very much also taking into account the CDNs, the role of CDNs, and how have they contributed to the IP interconnection market because this is, of course, a development that has you know, substantially changed the scene in the last five years. And the last um, assessment that Barrack did was um, um, uh, five years ago. So I think that when we talk about the regulatory asymmetry, this is one example of such asymmetry. And if you look at the internet ecosystem a bit more widely, we recently were with Jean-Jacques in the same Berec uh, workshop talking about submarine cables, uh, undersea connectivity. And there we see a little bit the same phenomenon. So we have these public cables where you, you know, sell capacity to, to, to others. Some of them are in consortia, including with European operators, uh, consortia with, with some of the big tech companies. But there, are, there is a substantial amount of cables that are purely private. And for example, European operators don't have the investment capacity to be running uh, many private cables um, uh, like that. But then, of course, we hear that about now about 70% of, for example, the traffic between the US and the EU goes through these private cables, so not actually being in the 
public best effort internet. And we are again here observing that the telcos uh, who in consortium are you know, now um, operating these cables that are publicly available and sell capacity. Um, you know, we should also think about what does that do to neutrality? So some content gets a real highway in a proprietary network, whereas other content has to go through these operated um, publicly available channels um, at a kind of best effort level. And, um, you know, we really applaud, I think it's great. I mean, this is not a regulated market. So I think it is great that, of course, that companies find, you know, that you invest and, and, and there's good things. But again, going back to the regulatory asymmetry, then when we look at uh, the positioning of how this traffic then comes into, in our case, Europe, and is then divided and goes through the national networks, we need to look at the market power. What, what does it do in this kind of bigger picture? And hence, we are very much also then, you know, welcoming the Berec's upcoming work on this. Uh, they will do work on the entry of CAPS into the uh, ECN market in European language, so content providers into the telecom markets. They are also going to be um, analyzing the role of cloud computing in this context, and also then doing a kind of a holistic mapping of the submarine connectivity um, uh, scenario. So I think that that will give us a bigger picture. And I understand that, you know, the fair contribution, it's, it's a very difficult sometimes to, to define because it is a very specific point in that ecosystem. But, you know, we need to look at the bigger picture and then see what, does this, what is the impact of this interconnection point vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the access network investment in Europe. So, Thank you very much for this. And actually, it will be very useful to also then to study the methodology that Derek will develop to do this kind of study that could even be used as a good practice uh, exported maybe globally, globally. I'm sure that Jean-Jacques has a reaction to your reaction. So please, Jean-Jacques. Yeah, thank you. I, I want to pick up on, on both Marit and, and KS's points. And I want to start by thanking Marit because I think it's been a debate that's really interesting where there have been these accusations flying about fair contributions saying that content and applications providers do not contribute. But as Marit has just explained very uh, in extensively, um, there are pretty massive contributions by content and applications providers. Of course, as, as Konstantinos was saying before, I think it was you, um, content and application providers help this ecosystem by providing the content and services without which, frankly, no one would pay telecom operators for an internet subscription. The only revenue that a telecom operator would make if it weren't for the content and applications that we invest in would be telephony and SMS. M if they want to go back to that, that's fine. They don't have a must-carry obligations for the internet they can stop being internet providers. Because the internet is about a network of network. Once you connect to one endpoint, you have access to the global network. That's what the internet is about. But you don't have to provide that service connecting to the global internet, the global unique open internet. You can provide private networks. That's a very profitable business. Or indeed, you can invest in new types of technologies that are related, like CDNs. You can be a CDN operator, and in fact, a lot of telecom operators have developed great CDN services which they're making a lot of money on. So going back to the contribution by content and application providers. So there's that massive investment by content and application providers in innovating, in uh, creating products that will delight customers and encourage them, therefore, to subscribe to uh, internet service providers services and upgrade their, their subscriptions to things like 5G, for instance, or fiber. Then you mentioned CDNs, and I think that's really important. Yes, there are CDNs. What do CDNs do? They help to transport traffic much more easily. And so that's another payment that content application providers can make in order to deliver the traffic to end users with better quality, another form of contribution. And, and then you mentioned things like subsea cables. Um, and the great thing about that is that whether they are private or public or a mix of public and private networks, again, they help to bring traffic much faster, more efficiently, and save massive costs for ISPs, because instead of ISPs having to fetch the content from another part of the world, the traffic is brought by those content and application providers 99% of the way to the user, and the telecom providers can do the last mile. That's a huge cost savings for the operators. Cloud services the same way. And when we look at how the cloud and associated services, some of the data analytics and AI can help to optimize network to support operators, which is what happens happening today. Again, it's saving costs for ISPs 
and it's providing new avenues for monetization for the telcos. So, as a summary, we're in a situation where there is absolutely zero point in claiming that there is no contribution by the content and application provider sectors because it I there is enormous contribution, as just uh, exposed by Marit. And more importantly, I think we should look at to the future. We should look at new technologies. We should look at the evolution of this market, as BEREC and OECD and others are doing, and look at the positives of how we can move forward together. There are improvements we can make to regulatory frameworks in Europe and elsewhere, in Brazil, etc. I think we should focus on that, on the real problems, look at the evidence, look at how we can help each other uh, uh, as an ecosystem, focus on that rather than uh, some people trying to instigate fights and fake battles when there's none to be had, and that would do a disservice to everyone. Excellent. Thank you very much for this. I see there are uh, questions, and I know also see there is one for at least from the audience. So uh, let's start with the question from the from the online. Uh, he wants to. So let's start with the question on site, and then if we can have some this online participant uh, speaking. Uh, we can do it, otherwise we will only stay with the, uh, otherwise the online participant can type the question and we will read it. Okay, thank you, Luca. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Raul Echeverria from Latin America Internet Association. And this is, uh, is, is uh, uh, I don't know if you know, but everything that is discussed in, uh, in, in Europe has a, a, a huge impact in the, in the policy agenda in, in, in Latin America, and this is not the exception. So it would be very uh, funny that uh, Europe abandoned the idea of, uh, of moving ahead with this and, and uh, we will have probably some decisions, policy decisions in some countries in, in, in the region. And uh, some years ago, it's, uh, all the, 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 the interconnection in between uh, ISPs and ISPs and, and content providers used to happen in Miami. And in the last uh, in the last few years, the internet technical community has done a huge effort to develop a, a complete uh, uh, new interconnection uh, ecosystem, and uh, and and has had a, a very positive impact in the in the access uh, the, uh, for the people. Uh, so, what would happen if, uh, for example, we are discussing this in now in in Brazil and also in the Caribbean? And that is a, is, a, is a very interesting because it's a kind of paradox because Brazil is probably the country that has invested more in, <laughs> in, in, in exchange points in the, in, in the world, maybe. And, uh, and the Caribbean is, uh, is probably one of the places who more needs <laughs> improved <laughs> interconnection. So it doesn't make sense that those are the, 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 the two places that we are, when we are discussing uh, where we are discussing this. But so what will happen? Who will win with this? As uh, as the colleague pointed out, 99% uh, of the of, of the bidding are informal and and for free. And why this is because uh, the content providers are ISPs and telcos are stupid? No, it's because the <laughs> all of them understand that they are adding value to each other, and uh, so the market already spoke. So what will happen with that? So wh what will happen, in my view, is that. The, if, a, if a country like Brazil adopt a policy on, on this, uh, that obviously companies will pay what they have to pay, and they will uh, uh, follow the law, but so they will not have uh, incentives to bring their caches and, the, and, and, and do peerings in the, in the change points, and to bring the caches into the, the, the telcos uh, infrastructure. So they will say, okay, we will pay what we have to pay, but y now you have to uh, uh, pick our contents in Miami. So we are going 15 years <laughs> back uh, and they will say, ah, and don't forget, probably, probably it will not be informal. Now we will have to sign some contracts, so we will involve our legal <laughs> departments and it will take one year to, to, to have uh, the contracts in place. Ah, and it will not, not be for free. <laughs> we will have to negotiate that. At the end of the day, the, <laughs> the situation will be the same than now. They will pay exactly what they is <laughs> they, they to, 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 to to share to to have us a, 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 a zero assume in the in the in the agreements, who so there will not be winners, but there will be there will be losers. Who are the losers? A small ISPs, small uh, content providers, a small platforms, a small let's say internet companies that will be in the long in the, the end of the tail uh, at the at the time of uh, starting negotiations uh, with the with the other parties. Uh, so I think that the disruption will be 
will be huge, and at the end of the day, the, the, the result for telcos and content providers will be probably the same. Thank you very much, Raul, for providing these additional uh, points. Do we have our remote participant, uh, participant speaker? Uh, can he or she speak? I don't, I don't see any satisfactory, 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 satisfactory <laughs> reaction from the Hello? technical team. Oh yeah. Oh, Gonzalo, we meet again. Hello, Please. Luca. Nice Hello. to see you Hello. again. Hello. Please. Hi. Uh, this is Gonzalo. I, I work for Telefonica, an ISP uh, present in Europe, an uh, uh, ENO member, so uh, working with, with Marit on, on the first year issue. I just wanted to address uh, a few of the comments that uh, have been raised in, during the session regarding the, 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 if the cost of the networks are going down and related to revenues and also related to, to how this virtual cycle is benefiting all of us. Uh, I would like to, to stress that uh, the, the telecom revenues have been decreasing for the European telecom sector 30% since 2011, while for example in the US, those same revenues have been increasing 18%. And at the same time, the returns of investment of the capital employees, which actually takes into account the revenues, the cost and investment has been lower, lower to 6% in Europe, where in the US, for example, that's at the level of 14. And actually that means that in Europe, the, the returns are lower than the cost of capital. So the money that we have to pay to get the funds for those investment is costing us more than the, uh, embed, than the returns that we make on those investments. So that means that this is not really a, a virtuous sequel. It is not a, a situation where we all benefit. In fact, it was the case at the very beginning of the internet, but it is not the case anymore. As it seems that when telecoms returns are lower than the cost of capital, we are losing money on every investment that we do. So basically, what we aim with Fair Share is actually trying uh, to foster the investments and to keep up the investment for the quality of the networks that the European needs. And for example, we can see that even though um, investments have been at uh, levels of 20% uh, of our revenues, which are similar to the rest of the world, in terms of uh, investment in euros per capita, in Europe, we have been at lower at levels of 100 euros, when in, in US that's 200 euros per capita. And that has meant that the, for example, the coverage of 5, 5G networks, the take up of 5G in Europe is 15%, whereas in, um, in Korea it's 50% or in the US it's 40%. So Europe is already falling behind in the development of networks. And that's why we want uh, to change the situation. And uh, one last comment on, on the in comment from, from Mr. Breton. I think that we have read a different uh, uh, publication because what I see that uh, Mr. Breton has uh, uh, commented is that he wants to go ahead with a digital network uh, act. And the fact uh, he, I have not seen any place that it has been delayed till 2025. If you see uh, how a legislative process works in Europe, it is impossible to implement a legislative process, process in one or two year time. So actually, even though the process might be starting, the proposal might be coming up in early 2024, it's impossible to have the, the, this uh, pass through the European Parliament before the general elections for the Parliament taking place in June. So actually, I don't see any delay there but uh, uh, being realistic and taking into account that legislative processes in Europe take two years the least, and in some cases, as you have seen with privacy, DMA, and so others, it takes more than three, even four times. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gonzalo, for these uh, elements. Uh, I think we, uh, we have less than 10 minutes left, so I would ask all of the panelists to have a last chance to provide uh, a final remark, uh, some food for thought, because we have already had a lot of very interesting comments, discussions. Sorry? Uh, this was not the question. Okay, I thought it was, there is another question. Uh, 
what is the question? That maybe this can this question from the. So I, let me also thank Shilpa Singh from the University of Melbourne, who is our remote moderator. So do we have a, a, a question for from the from the online participant. Can you can you take a mic? Can can we pass a mic? So this may, may yeah, qu this question, question may, may inspire uh, your last thoughts. And yes, you. Please, Shilpa. Yeah, uh, my very rough understanding for contribution is to redistribute the money from OTT to telecos. My question is to share what. In the previous session that this person organized, uh, uh, this person shared the same opinion. And is it OK if it is treated as this particular money is used as a universal service fund for rural areas to improve the whole balance sheet to Telecom is not adequate in her, in her opinion. Okay, excellent. So the, I think the question is whether if this money would be used to improve uh, universal ser service uh, funds or s for other uh, uses. You can reflect on this question while you think about your final thought. So I would like to start maybe with, uh, with uh, Camila. And so we, go we follow the order. Let's say one minute per person. I'm going to be quick. Uh, I can see like a bit of titans in here of different industries, uh, which is also important to understand all of the arguments, but beyond uh, of these arguments and beyond of the argument that we're mostly focused also in the global north, like I can understand that Europe has a different context, but we are talking about two practices that harm consumers. Zero rating, which continues to affect the global south, favoring tax by alleged the, the, the free and limited access, which in practices is a bundle, like uh, it obliged people to use some apps. And fair share that might favorize telcos and potentially increases uh, the prices and uh, reduce quality, as uh, we, were we were talking about Korea. So in both cases, we are talking about the distortion of, of uh, telecom market, uh, of present practices or future practices. But in the end, we are talking about we are not focusing on how this affects consumers in the end. We are talking about industry's interests. So let's focus on consumers when we're talking about this, on open internet access, on meaningful connectivity, and how to increase access, not, not, on, we, not on, on how we can uh, impulsionate companies. So thank you. Uh, thank you. So um, just to the question that we said, yes, of course, from our point of view, these funds would be going towards investment and especially in those areas where we don't have coverage, but also in, in capacity. But going to my um, final comment, I would like to say that Thomas was saying that it might be difficult for us to be here, but I would like to say it's actually a real pleasure because we took a decision early on in this discussion, actually before we published the very first report, that we want to have the discussion with everybody, with all stakeholders, openly ourselves, and not hiding behind think tanks or consultancies. And I think that we are trying to live true to this um, intention that we had. And I think I will provide one personal thought and one uh, political thought. Personal thought, I think this is a very healthy checkup of the internet ecosystem to see where we are today. And in the case of Europe, where we have a kind of a, you know, intense regulatory framework to see what needs to be done there. And a political message comes from our friend, all of our friend, Thierry Breton, who in the LinkedIn post two days ago says that we need, quote, a bold future-oriented, game-changing Digital Networks Act to redefine the DNA of our telecoms regulation, unquote. And I'm just really pleased, and we put a statement out as Edna and GSMA, that the Commission has this ambition to actually deliver a new regulatory kind of a framing for us. And this, we hope, means that there will be fair contribution, but we also hope very much that they will address some of the pain points on competition, on scale, on, on sector-specific uh, regulation that I was describing earlier. So thank you. Thank you. So uh, my final message would be, uh, as a regulator in Brazil, that we really should assess and define precisely the, the disease that we want to heal before prescribing the medication. So uh, you have a commitment of regulator in Brazil of having an evidence-based approach 
And well, if the problem is lack of money for investment in networks, we should design a model that allows more money for investment in networks. And for example, d depending on the way you design a fair share, uh, you may or may not reach that objective. So if, if there's a competition between prices and you create a fair share, there's a great chance that this money runs away by lowering more and more the prices, because there's competition over pricing for the user, and so no money is left for investment. So this should be designed in a way to get what we really want, which is money for investment. Uh, so that's the final message that I bring, that the commitment, the commitment of Brazilian regulator that will make all the effort to, to gather evidence to try and find the disease before, before prescribing the medication. Excellent. This was indeed, evidence-based policy should be based on evidence, and so we are very happy that that we are pr that this panel is providing a lot of very good thoughts on how to collect this evidence. Final round of. Thank you, and, and thanks again for having us. Um, We've been trying to organize a, a workshop at the AGF. We did a proposal, really balanced panel, etc. It wasn't accepted, so I'm really glad that Luca and team organized this. Really, really glad that we were able to get to be together and here as representative of all stakeholder groups. And I think that's one of the things that's come out here. Um, all stakeholders should be invited to, to speak. I hope that we can see that across all those discussions, that we can have consumer organizations, civil society organizations, alongside industry, academics, technical community being regularly and proactively invited to speak at these events in Brussels, in Brasilia, and elsewhere. Um, I think that would be fantastic to see in the future. Um, and then I think what we've also heard is that there's clearly from, from all the speakers, including, uh, including Etno, that it's quite clear that there are uh, ma massive investments, contributions by content and application providers, including to network infrastructure. Uh, and so CAPS con contribute fairly and I think that's quite a clear conclusion here. Um, yeah, I think just going back to what Arthur was rightly saying, this should be about evidence. Uh, I think there's just a lot of lobbying arguments that are flying around, quotes from this, from that. I think we should focus on expert analysis, BEREC, telecom regulators, OECD, German Monopolist Credit Mission, and others who are studying this. And indeed, as Marit was saying, you should be taking a broad, holistic perspective on the market and its evolution, absolutely. And so we look forward to uh, you know, further analysis of the, what, what's already been produced by these expert organizations and also what they're already uh, starting to work on next. And just to finish up, I think really important what we've heard or, or already, just starting with the Global South perspective, let's remind ourselves what this is all about. This is about access to information at the end of the day. This is what the global and open internet brought us. We did not have such an amazing access to the internet globally through a simple connection to one network just 30 years ago, or indeed 20 years ago, or indeed 10 years ago in many parts of the world. And it's thanks to the work of many telecom operators, content providers, local communities that have developed this, etc., etc., and the technical community in this room and in this venue are to be thanked for all of that. And so let's be really careful in these debates that we don't tinker with the foundational open nature of the internet that means that we, uh, we have access to all this information and this utility that is good for consumers, for us as users, for our everyday lives and our everyday economies, and it can had has and will continue to boost those economies and, our so and, and, and benefit our societies in the future. Let's not tinker with that. Let's not end up with information winners and losers, whether it's in the global south or the global north. This is about the global internet, whether it's north, south, west, or east, and we shouldn't tinker with these basic open foundations. Thank you. Uh, correction. I think somebody said uh, Korea, uh, Korean telcos are profiting a lot from the standard pay model, so they could afford to uh, increase the 5G coverage to what, 50%? Well, that, that is because only Korean telcos with their oligopoly uh, 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 hold on the market, they sold the new phones only with the 5G features. So consumers are uh, forced to buy uh, 5G phones, and but, uh, 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 but the, uh, uh, the, the connectivity is, is, 5G connectivity is so bad that uh, there are 5G consumers filing class action lawsuits against telcos right now, and so bad that uh, 5G bandwidth license were taken away by the government. So, uh, you know, the no, no rose, pi rose picture error. And I think this answers the last question that just came in. 
will telcos use the new uh, uh, you know, uh, revenues from uh, center pay model for uh, in de 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 uh, developing more network? I don't think so. I mean, monopoly, uh, when it becomes uh, profitable, it becomes self-perpetuating. They want more profit. Uh, Korea case shows uh, that's not the case. I mean, we are in Japan. Internet penetration rate, uh, both Japan, Korea at the top, that's just penetrate, like what, where, where the internet is. In terms of connectivity, if you use, a, I've, I've never used a Wi-Fi this fast in Korea. Uh, the difference between Japan and Korea, big telcos in Korea are not participating in internet exchanges. There is no internet exchange in Korea. Big telcos in Japan, they are all participating in internet, big, big internet exchanges in, in Japan. Uh, in terms of uh, 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 in terms of uh, uh, connectivity across the country, Japan is much better. When I said cost is per falling, I meant cost per unit of megabyte that is delivered. That is definitely falling. Uh, I, I somebody's lying if if if, if, uh, if somebody's saying that it's, it's not falling. Uh, therefore, you know, d despite the falling revenues, because of the uh, uh, because of the falling cost, that's why the profit is being maintained by European European telcos, but. The final question, why are we talking about revenues falling of private companies? I mean, when Facebook booted out MySpace, when Google booted out Yahoo from the market, we never talked about you know, what's fair and what's unfair, right? I mean, if, uh, if, 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 it's, if it's becoming so unprofitable that, you know, profitable that you cannot maintain profits, maybe we should turn telecoms into public utilities. <laughs> okay. A, yes, a lot yes, of yes, interesting yes. thoughts. Yes, go I ahead. see applause in the room. Um, yeah, I, I want to go back to the question again. So, uh, as as Kes Park has perfectly outlined, even if it, that money were to be invested in the network, the quality that we as users would experience would still be worse than we have today. And there's also ample studies and evidence that money is actually not the bottleneck in network rollout. So, very often, there are other factors at play. And so, particularly in the context of Europe, it would not really help us solve the problems in rural areas that we still have. Um, and to me, really, to I want to close on what I deem to be the most shameful thing as a European here, uh, talking about this issue with now uh, this ludicrous idea having become picked up by so many other world regions. And there's only one reason for that, corporate capture of the European Commission. I mean, a former CEO of France Telecom has managed to make his way into the Commission, warmed up a 10-year-old idea that at its face is just crazy for everyone and now we have a public consultation with everybody's voices proving that it is crazy, proving that it is refused by everyone except the telcos. And what is the response that we hear today from Telefonica? Uh, oh, we don't make enough money. Sorry, but if that is your sole argument, then yeah, maybe we should really rethink business models. And um, ultimately what the uh, Digital Networks Act or whatever it is called, there will be something. I mean, Breton has to deliver s for his cronies at least something that will deregulate the market. And I fear that, again, that this will go against the success recipe for telecoms, which is competition and cooperation. We don't need, like the US, an oligopoly of a few very big mafia-like telecom companies. Um, and and uh, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. The final word to Constantino. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you so, so much. Uh, so very quickly, um, to the last question about USS, because we were also having a conversation uh, yesterday. I don't think that, you know, we could discuss USFs, but I don't think that this is what telcos want. Here I have, uh, a, it's a blog post from Telefonica saying why Europe shouldn't copy the USA's Universal Service Fund. So, and why the direct payments is actually a better option. Um, and Europe really is setting a very bad example. Uh, and this is why, uh, and this will be a, a sort of a pitch, um, there is a global concern from civil society. There was a, a statement that was re released yesterday. More than 20 organizations from around the world, civil society organizations, co-signed it. Brazil, India, in Europe, the United States, um, they express the same concerns about the same issue. And I think that it is time that if we want to have a conversation about infrastructure, let's have it. But this is not the way to do it. Because obviously, 
no one really wants this conversation to happen apart from telecom operators. All right. Uh, we I think we what we demonstrated today that we there is also other ways of having the conversation, and I'm very happy we had a lot of different views represented. I would like to thank everyone for their effort, not only to be here at Alpha Eight, to fly here, or even to stay to 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 contribute as Gonzalo did uh, while in Europe. So a lot of very good ideas, a lot of food for thought. I think that everyone here now has the sufficient element to form its own opinion independently. Thank you very much to everyone and have an excellent uh, end of IGF.